Hi, and welcome to the second annual Dallas Conference, hosted by Dallas Gate. Although we are here on Zoom, this weekend would not be possible without the support and vision of those volunteering their time at the Dallas Gate Center. The Xuanzu Dallas Gate Center, located in Francistown, New Hampshire, is Dallas master Joe Xuanyun's dream turned into a reality. It's a place where students can visit, can live and study Taoism through meditation, Qigong, and Wudong martial arts. The center's mission is to serve as a sanctuary for cultural exchange and retreat. It is in the spirit of cultural exchange that we bring you this conference. Taoism and its influence on Chinese philosophy, arts, and culture have inspired billions of people across the world. The Tao Te Ching, for example, is considered the second most translated book in the world after the Bible, and symbolism like the Tai Chi Tzu, composed of yin and yang, moving in harmony, and five element theory are known across the world. However, it is often lost in the West that these are not just ancient books and ideas frozen in time. Most of the information available in Taoism is translated by non-practitioners and studied in an academic and dry context. This approach flies in the face of how Taoism has historically been passed down and is passed down to this day, directly transmitted wisdom passed from teacher to student. One hallmark of Taoists throughout history are their ability to help and advise others in times of need. Whether by medicine, there's a saying that nine out of every 10 Taoists are doctors of some kind, by advising the country's leaders to keep the peace for their citizens and prevent disaster, or by navigating the depths of their consciousness on the inside and helping people to understand destiny and life purpose on the outside. Taoism would indeed be very boring and limited if we could truly comprehend a work, even something as short and uh, simple as the Tao Te Ching, at least on the outside, without the guidance of a teacher or practices coming from the tradition itself. The issues that challenge humanity may have never been more obvious than they have been in the past several years. Disease and war have threatened our ability to breathe and created the potential for massive violence with the click of a button or pulling of a trigger. And generations of abuse and neglect have threatened the land's ability to provide us with the basic essentials of fresh food and shelter. In so many facets of life, we see energy put towards argument and debate rather than the humility and understanding we need to unite and overcome these obstacles. Our need to find balance and harmony with the natural way, with the Tao, has never been more urgent. With this conference and lineup of speakers, we hope to showcase authentic Taoist teachers and their teachings that are just as relevant now as they are at any point in history, offering our community practices, wisdom, and context for our modern time to connect this rich culture with the present here, and also help those who are interested in Taoism to understand some of the core practices of Taoist practice. We have presentations on scripture, destiny, our connection to time and space, martial arts, meditation, and how these ideas weave into the complex fabric of the modern world. We are very excited to present these four teachers as living, breathing examples of the tradition. So we invite you to really engage with some of these ideas, to ask questions, and to engage with this worldview. So without further ado, let's introduce our first speaker at this conference. Josh Painter is a 22nd generation Longman Taoist. He is a Taoist studies major at Bard College in Athena Yunnan University and has been a licensed acupuncturist and herbalist for 22 years. Co-founder of Parting Clouds Taoist Education, Josh and his group have translated four of the main Taoist liturgical texts and teach ongoing classes. There is so much, and I'll use uh, air quotes here, interpretation when we talk about Taoist texts being translated, Taoist practices being taught in a Western context. But I think one thing that I really appreciate about Josh is his willingness to actively explore what it means to be a Westerner teaching Taoism to other Westerners, or often other Westerners, having to, of course, adapt to that reality while still being firm in the teaching within the tradition rather than extrapolating meaning that isn't there. To paraphrase his own words, being willing to engage with Taoism as it is, not as we wish it would be. So without further ado, Josh, you can take it away. What I want to, to do today is, is really essentially a commentary on what Sam has just introduced. Um, the Taoist tradition, of course, in the West is an interpreted tradition. It's not necessarily a received tradition. And these are two very different things. Um, we, we've been interpreting Taoism since the 1800s through the lens of Victorian thinkers, Jesuit priests and the like. Um, and because of that, 
a lot of the tradition is viewed through the lens of the the monotheist um also the uh the european protestant and so it's become a favorite um interpretation of taoism that the taoist experience is one of a individual in their direct correspondence to um, an interpreted version of the Tao, a deified version of the Tao in many cases, unfortunately. And what this does is this, this lessens the, um, the, uh, the, the more or less native understanding of um, both the Tao and the individual's interaction in general contexts. And so um, what I want to do today is look for, through the use of scripture, um, primarily one of the four main liturgical scriptures, I want to try to unveil some of the essential features of um, the Taoist notion of uh, society, not just our individual cultivations, because Taoism is essentially marked by two um, primary versions of cultivation. One, of course, is what we were just referring to, is the, uh, the individual's cultivation of their experience and coalescence with the Tao itself. But the other is the individual's relationship to community, which is a very important feature of Taoism, which has deep tendrils that intertwine Chinese culture itself. And so, as um, students of Taoism, we should understand um, both of these modalities, both the individual and the communal. Um, let me share my screen. We can begin talking about this. Can you allow my screen share, Sam? Still says disabled. It's good now. Okay. Great. One of the primary texts um, concerning um, notions of cause and effect in Taoism is the San Guan Jing. We see we'll see also um, aspects of this in the other scriptures we're looking at today. But the San Guan Jing, I think is, a, is an essential text for us in our current era, especially considering as the title of this conference suggests, this is a post pandemic world. And when we experience um, cataclysm or uh, various calamities that are experienced collectively um, to both good people and bad people, as it were, we want to actually consider how these things come about. How could there be um, these occurrences that seem to be larger than our own personal experiences and causes and effects? The, um, the San Guan Jing um, starts out with um, a description of the deities in the celestial realm um, in their various departments and offices um, with the host of other immortals, as we can, as we can read here, um, releasing their great brilliance um, upon, upon the lands um, below. Um, Sam, I'm getting all of the doorbells and things for the admissions people. Is, I'm just going to admit them. Is that okay? Uh, I'm taking care of that, so don't. don't okay. Push okay. I won't, I won't. I'll I won't. I won't worry. The sound off. I'm sorry. Great. Great. Um, and then the scripture here begins its real trajectory into what I want to talk about today, 
it says though the, these these celestials are in their domain um in the world of yanfu that's our region in the cosmology of um this is to say the human realm um all beings suffer bitterness perpetrate evils and ignore the good now we can play with the tense here as in this scripture this could be while in the world of yanfu all beings suffered bitterness perpetuated perpetrated evils and ignored the good as this all scriptures whenever a scripture starts with at that time this suggests that there was a time before the um the transmission of this scripture and a time after and so the scripture itself is a reporting of an event that is transformative in the human experience and so we can read this in two different tense um, senses um but uh we read it in the present tense as practitioners because we want to perpetually understand that our existence um is both before scripture and after scripture revelation um because we do suffer bitterness and we do perpetrate evils and we do ignore the good for instance and that's the purpose of the scripture is to um assist us in navigating these realities um they have vast entanglements and hostilities in all of their many activities little is produced i'm just going to read some of this for you then we'll comment then i'll comment their money exchanges are unwholesome they are disrespectful to both heaven and earth to the sun and moon and the three radiances they scold the wind and curse the rain they cheat the divinities and annihilate their likenesses they are fraudulent before heaven and deceitful before earth blasphemous before the sages disrespectful to their parents and cousins and all six relations it goes on to describe all of these negative qualities of humanity they utterly fail at following the correct path by taking much and giving little in return this is an essential understanding that i think is left out of a lot of the um discussions on taoism taoism can be portrayed as a as a selfish activity one where someone um the the, the famous misreading of taoism is that we should just go with the flow but what if the flow is to do all of these things to be adulterous and licentious etc what if that's what our our innate desires are telling us to do um going with the flow without correction and navigation could actually lead to worse and uh, worse and worse events and ways of being um it's like uh, i just heard recently somewhere this was interesting uh, I'm, i'll paraphrase it you know the self help section at bookstores is vast usually and the titles are com are constantly added to those shelves on an ongoing basis and if we if we think about just the title of self help we can see why that would be a perpetually filled bookcase because none of those books will ever perfectly succeed because the self is the primary goal within that context in in thinking about that we could think that those shelves would have one book or just a title for those shelves if it were help others instead of self help and in taoism we really focus on this notion of helping the other as an important and critical crucial aspect of cultivation so this phrase here taking much while giving little in return we can't just walk over that one they it, it says they utterly fail at following the correct path by taking much while giving little in return so our greatest failure is to act in self-centered ways now we see this even in the early um texts of taoism particularly uh in the laozi in his uh three we call them the laozi's three main precepts within the dao de jing and the precept corresponding to this would be the precept of not putting one's self first when we put ourselves first we can see that much of this litany here of of uh negative actions is actually derived from putting one's self first one's self interest one's self help because 
when we're concerned only with ourselves, our every transaction is oriented towards our profit. Our every conversation is oriented toward um, affirming our reality and our feelings, etc. Now these beings in Yanfu, our realm, who are going around in these ways that this scripture reports, fail to cultivate even a sliver of goodness. Heaven will not tolerate this, earth will not bear it, and so they will bring forth great adversities. Now this next line really jumps out at us, and they will cause these deities who are watching um, human activity will cause epidemics to disease and disease to spring up. And these many contagions will be the opposition against the infractions. The severity of this will be inescapable. These are thus the reasons concerning these matters, the means by which this suffering and retribution comes about. So what we have here is, this is the fire and brimstone statement within the Taoist liturgical tradition. You know, we, we, we like to believe that this stuff doesn't exist in our tradition as Westerners, because in the West, this is some of the stuff that we ran from in our native uh, upbringings, whether it be the Judeo-Christian tradition or anything akin or you know, parallel to that. Um, and so this, this passage here, um, really speaks to us about cause and effect. These reasons concerning these matters, the means by which the suffering and retribution comes about. If we act in self-centered ways, we're going to suffer together. If we can't live in peace and happiness together, then we will certainly suffer together in a collective suffering. Um, and so by acting in self-interest, we then cause the, the um, we set forth the causation for collective suffering. Um, pernicious sufferings will be delivered upon the body with no source of relief. Taijoku Tianzun then appealed to the three origins. This is the, these are the Sanguan, the three deities who are this scripture concerned centrally. Good. May all of these living beings meet with these punishments, bitterness, and suffering. So the deities in this text are saying they deserve it. Um, that there is, uh, that this cause and effect system is effective. However, Taijo Ku Tianzun states, what if there are good men and faithful women who take refuge in the three origins and who for three years can observe the fasts and precepts. Now we have a central concept within the lineages for sure, but even within lay practice, we can consider what this means, this term precepts. Um, when we as practitioners consider um, our innate nature, who we are as we exist within the um, total confluence with the Tao, as an embodiment, as a manifestation of the Tao, we, we consider that that aspect of the self, that innate self, that Xing, our inborn nature, is benevolent. The problem is that that benevolence is enwrapped in the experiences of all of our cause and effect. All of which is to say, the the causes that we have put into motion in pre, either in previous lifetimes or within this lifetime will manifest in in like kind in their effects. So if we are violent, we will receive violence. If we're stingy, we'll re we'll receive stinginess, etc. And so, in the Taoist um, worldview, we have to entrain ourselves in certain ways. Um, this again is inconsistent with the 1960s interpretation of Taoism, the go with the flow Taoism, which would suggest that 
we are one with the Tao. We just go with the flow and everything works out. The problem with that is that that's not the tradition. So it's clearly not the tradition. The tradition states that you can go with the flow only after you have coalesced with the Tao in, in a way that your benevolence becomes your total manifest self. And so in order to arrive at that, that place in that with those qualities intact, we have to begin by engaging a process, a preceptual process where we define parameters for ourselves that establishes ways of being, guardrails or um, limits to our activities that um, we go through our daily lives remembering, being conscious of, um, being mindful of. So when we wake up, we commit ourselves, we, um, we take refuge in the, the teachings, the scriptures, and the Tao itself, and commit ourselves to being akin to those three treasures through the um, um, these ways of being. And so we commit to being generous today, or we commit to being nonviolent today, or we commit to being honest today. And in actuality, we commit to all of those things every day at all times. And through that, we then begin the, the winnowing process of um, both creating good causes for future outcomes and also uh, destabilizing coming events in our karmic cycle. This is the, the view. Um, and so we can correct um, our habitual desire or aggression based um, impulses. Um, we, can, we can receive those, we can intercept those, and we can then uh, resist acting in certain ways. And then in place of selfishness, we can put um, forth generosity. And in that way, we set up the causes for um, uh, future events that will be um, more favorable for us and others around us. It also says in the scripture, in addition to the observing fasts and precepts, um, uh, that's jai and jie. Jai fasting means basically just abstention, not fasting in terms of dietary fasting. Of, of course, it can include that too. That means to fast from or to resist our impulses and ways of overacting and in the ways that we were just discussing. In addition to that though, it says that these individuals should make it their destiny to recite this scripture in rounds numerous times, even thousands of times, and enthusiastically confess and repent. Now, this is interesting as well, because this could be, if you haven't read a scripture like this, uh, this is a daily read scripture, by the way. So this is a central feature of Taoist practice as it exists in the, in the um, certainly in the monastic communities, but even in the practitioner lay communities, we don't expect things like confession and repentance. We might expect precepts, but confession and repentance can actually be, they trigger us in the West. They can be repugnant to us because they have that quality that we associate with guilt and the like. The problem though, is that in Taoism, this is a this is a very consequential behavior that we undergo, which is to come to terms with our habitual ways and the negative impacts that they may have, just particularly if these are negative ways of being. And we also and so we want to confess maybe maybe not to others, but certainly to the self, which is to say, confession could be something which is just self inspection or introspection. Confession doesn't have to be a, a public shaming event. It can be as simple as, boy, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that that was mean of me or that was selfish of me. It could be as simple as that. This is a confession. Who are we confessing to? 
we're confessing to our higher self, which is the deity within in some sense. When we say repent, this is another quality central to Taoist practice. And these are all in the cultivation of what we call Ming, by the way. Um, and repentance is um, when an act has already happened and we have introspectively come to terms with the fact that we wish that it hadn't happened because we failed to observe a precept, which was to avoid it in the first place, then we can repent for it. Repentance is could work like this in the Taoist context. And we use a text, it's since the Qing dynasty, but there's a methodology that we use, some of us, called a gong guo ge, which is a, a, a ledger of merits and demerits, where we literally write these things down. So we're confronted with our own um, uh, daily transactions uh, ethically, so that we um, aren't in the habit of covering things up uh, and um, sort of sweeping them under the carpet. So repent for us means that we actually commit to not perpetuating that behavior in ourselves and that we show this remorse so that we can lessen by 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 making an action either in thought speech or body which is to say um, doing something with our actual form not just thinking it or saying it these have um varying effects in our karma um, as the, from the less to the greatest, from mind to action. Um, by repentance, what we do is we shift the karmic effect to be lesser because we're, we've recognized it while it's still in its latent form or in its seed form. And by repentance, we damage the karmic seed. We damage its ability to be um, prolific or fecund. And so by that damage, we lessen the effects of our actions so that if we can't create good karma from a bad act, we can certainly lessen its effect. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, in the scripture, let's return to scripture here for a second. The celestial worthy spoke, unprincipled and discordant with serpent's fangs and a tiger's mouth, with hearts like awls and knives, these are the malicious people. They have ghost eyes and ghost hearts and are excessively calculating and deceitful. They sing lies to the ignorant. How could the foolish even know? They slice flesh from the others, caring not for their poverty, but only for their own enrichment. They grow, their family grows fat from the sweat of others. Mm. This passage here is interesting, especially what follows, in that we can see the, the desire for self-preservation can become perverse in the sense that, and we have to do this very delicate dance, in our own self-preservation, of course, we have to obtain food. We have to obtain some version of money. Um, we have to have these things for our own continuation. But there becomes a point where we end up doing, as the scripture says, slicing the flesh from others, caring not for their poverty, but only for our, their own enrichment or our own enrichment, that we could grow fat off of the sweat of others. Be, the, the name of this um, conference, again, this post-pandemic world, modern age, we're all familiar with this, the reality uh, that is um, voiced here. This tendency, especially um, nowadays, for there to be um, a maniacal pursuit of um, wealth or, or material. Um, that seems to be, I think we can all agree that there, at least as it's written here, especially if we view it this way, there's an ethical issue there. But as practitioners, 
that should also be pointed out, I want to point out, that it's not just about, as practitioners, we're not just concerned with the, the karmic result here in this sense, but we're also concerned with the changes that this creates in our consciousness. Because if the precepts, if repentance and, um, uh, and, and uh, I'm sorry, what was the other one? And remorse. <laughs> if those, um, if those are the categories that we're looking at to think about the cultivation of a of a, a Tao like mind, then there is the possibility of moving in the reverse direction, not just in terms of karmic result, but also in the changes in consciousness. So when the mind engages thus, which is to say, in total selfishness, with concentration, which is to say, to fixate on these selfish ways, then the basis for attachment forms. That is the issue, interestingly, that, that, that bridges the gap for us. I'm gonna mute you, Pablo. Um, the, um, the basis for attachment, this is an essential understanding that attachment is the root of or is is entwined with one of the three po what we call the three poisons, which would be ignorance, um, aggression, and passion. Attachment is it's a very complex um, concept, but it's a it's essentially a mental habituation where we see reality in a certain way and we lose sight of its ultimate um, of, of ultimate reality if we ever had it or we, if we don't have that ultimate reality um, awareness, which is what the, of course we're yearning for and practicing toward, um, this, these attachments get us further and further away from ultimate uh, realization. And once attachment forms, which is, which is to say the, the full entrapment in um, ignorance, then the root of sin becomes more difficult to annihilate because we're perceiving reality from the perspective of our greed. We're completely entrapped. There's only a desire for one's own wealth and profit. Literally, that is the primary feature of that consciousness. Then, because of that, like a thunder rumbling from the sky, pestilence will spread and circulate. The body will be enwrapped with troubles. Grievances and transgressions will come in pairs, even falling upon one's children and grandchildren. This um, notion in Taoism is divergent from the notion in Buddhism as, as far as I have seen. Um, this notion of the familial um, transmission of karma, children, grandchildren, and further generations, we find that all the way back in the Taiping um, uh, in the Taiping Jing, one of the earliest um, organized Taoist religious texts. Um, and in that sense, we don't, it's not just us that suffers, it's our community that suffers. And when we look around today, turn on the news, we can see that we are collectively suffering. And we can also see an extraordinary exposition of um, greed in this world as well. And so this text was written a long time ago, but it really talks about essential human conditions that we can experience readily today simply by taking a look outside of our immediate surroundings or po possibly even within our immediate surroundings. Um, So the celestial, the, the heaven official, the celestial official says that in order to undo this, we should regret our transitions and faults, cut ourselves off from evil and cultivate good. Then all at once the earth official will absolve your sins. All of your evils, treacheries, every last one completely pardoned and removed. The mind and its conditions of apprehension and disturbance will completely return to the upright and correct. 
So this, this brings up two characters, the zheng, upright. The opposite of upright is xie, like wobbly or crooked. Um, and so uh, when the mind is wobbly or crooked, it's like a tool that is not true. If we have a saw that's bent, it's going to make poor cuts. If we have um, a level that is in somehow disturbed, we can't make the basis for all other things, the foundations upon which all other structures are built, the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure is problematic. And so if the mind and its conditions return to the upright and correct, then we have a second chance at creating um, both in future lives and in this life better conditions, um, especially and essentially the condition we're looking for is the condition of the peace and tranquility required for our ultimate, um, the ultimate revelation through practice of um, uh, the perception, the direct perception of ultimate reality. Once confused and stupefied, the ears, eyes, and mind will become calm. And we, it goes on from here. Now, this all points at um, the necessity within our cultivations to not just be about us alone, in a room on a cushion. We can see how the basis for the mind itself and the karma that we exist within, the, the framework of our experienced existence is dependent on the appropriate conditions for cultivation. Those conditions are derived karmically. And so should we want to live in a nation at peace, with, the, with enough abundance that we aren't working 16 hours a day so that we have time to cultivate, that we can afford text, potentially teachers, whatever it is that, we're, that will support our cultivation, then it, we can see from the San Guan Jing and those passages that it is, it is not encoded or encrypted language, by the way, it's very forceful and obvious that our relationship to others our relationship to generosity, our relationship to passivity, peace, peacefulness, is central to our ability to form the basis for ultimate cultivation. And so we see here the beginning of um, the conversation of one of the seminal dyads of Taoist um, methodologies is uh, the dyad of the mind and the body uh, this, by the way, the, 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 the dyad of Xing and Ming, the dyad of form and emptiness, the, this dyadic reality within Taoism is found in many terms, obviously. Sent, they, they seem to all point back at the same thing, though, that um, our innate nature that, we're, that is inborn suffers or enjoys its relationship to our lived experience and that those two things must be cultivated in tandem. Um, to isolate oneself in a certain way, um, in, a, in, a, in a selfish way, potentially even, um, may yield certain um, uh, achievements, but that is not a full cultivation. And also living in a worldly context in the right kinds of ways, generosity and the like, that too, is not a full cultivation. It still requires um, the direct understanding of our, or, or perception of our innate nature and its, and its context in the non-dual um, reality. Um, but what we're looking at here is this requisite um, interaction with the world around us. We, we think that Taoism is uh, something that exists in caves and isolation, but this and many other scriptures specifically point at that not necessarily being the case. Um, of course, it is the case in some contexts, but we can see too that 
there's a lot more to this. Um, and so when we look at the 12 hopes, this is at the end of the San Guan Jing, and there's also um, hopes or aspirations or vows. The character could be translated as vow, as hope, as aspiration. And it, all of them are possible and potential. Um, but at the, at the end of many liturgical scriptures, we have this sort of affirmation of our um, hopes. But if we look at these, we can, and by the way, these are usually at the culminating um, end of a liturgical recitation. So this is something in, in uh, so to speak, this is, this is like, here's the thing we want you to leave with when you, when you leave the altar today. It happens in that aspect of the liturgy. It's sort of near the end. It's what's ringing in your head when you walk away from the altar. So when we look at this, we want to remember that this is sort of the final reminders before you go. So these hopes or vows are supposed to be the, the culminating takeaway. And so when we look at them, we can look for qualities that are being um, handed to us through the tradition. These are, these are, um, essentially, um, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting all the boops and beeps from people entering. Um, this is, the 12 hopes are a way for us to, um, have a pocket, a pocket sized um, takeaway. The first hope that the winds are harmonious and the grains are favorable. So this is not the first hope of the 12 hopes is not that I achieve enlightenment. It doesn't say I in there at all. I'm not hoping for me anywhere in that statement. This is for the entirety of both mankind and all other sentient beings. The second hope, that the harvest and five grains are abundant. Again, this is not me or I. The third hope, that the emperor lives long. Now this seems strange, but this is because political stability is a recognized reality for overall peace and happiness in any um, human context. The fourth hope, that the nation is peaceful. They're still not seeing me, I. The fifth hope, that the people are prosperous. The sixth hope, that there are blessings, long life, health, and peace. The seventh, that calamities, disasters, and misfortunes are dispelled. Eighth, that fire and water do not invade. Ninth, that there will be intelligence and wisdom. Tenth, that those who study the Tao achieve perfection. Eleven, that all of the spirits are supportive and protective. And twelve, that the deceased transverse and traverse and ascend. And then at the end, for all of the birds and four-legged beasts, of all of the insects and snakes, all of the enemies and creditors, all of the men and women who are orphaned souls, the four forms of birth, the four forms of birth are those beings born from the water, from the uterus, from the egg, and from the chrysalis, and the six conditions of existence. The six conditions of existence are celestial, spirit, human, hungry ghost, animal, and hell. And all of those in the cold forest, those who are deceased, their bones are the, in the cold forest. May they hear these scriptures, listen to these teachings, and soon traverse and ascend. This traverse and ascend is a very important thing to understand. And we'll get to that in one second as we close this discussion. But what we see here in the 12 hopes is that this is a, these are universal hopes. These are about the entirety of all sentient beings, including the insects and snakes and even our enemies and creditors. This is specifically put in there so that we recognize that we aren't partial to those people who are favorable to us in our wishes for there to be um, peace, prosperity, and the like. That we even include those people who we esteem to be um, the negative influences in our life, etc. But this traverse and ascend, uh, this is um, and uh, soon, 
the Chinese phrase here is zao chao sheng. It's a, for those of you who are students of um, Xuan Yun, I believe that when Xuan Yun finds a dead animal, he will say that phrase over that dead animal. Uh, you may have seen him picking up squirrels from the street or something. I know he's um, been known to do that. Um, that zao chao sheng means that may this entity quickly and soon find a birth that is above this current status of this lifetime that it just left, that it's moving upward in its trajectory toward enlightenment, that it will not go down into the hells, for instance, wherein there's eternities of suffering before the karma is burned off and ascent can occur. Let me just see if we want to do this one. Yeah, it's 10. We have 15 minutes to do this. And in the questions and answers, we can even touch on other issues because I'm sure that the scripture that we, are, we may leave out will be um, um, an opportunity for discussion. Um, now, this is from Ancestor Cho's writing on repentance. Um, this is a famous, very famous scripture for us in lineages as there's a lot revealed in this particular passage in the Gong Ke. It's this in the morning um, recitations, by the way, if you're curious. So every day when we, in the morning, we read this among other things. Um, it, it begins in earnest here. We vow to perceive the perfect mind and strive to repent. So this is this vow that we're making to perceive the perfect mind and strive to repent. Now. The fact that these two things show up in the same sentence is interesting because what this sentence does for us is this, this, there's a dichotomy here of repentance and perfection. The dichotomy is that this perfect mind is talking about Xing and this repentance is talking about Ming. This is encrypted. Um, we're talking about the, the mind and the body. We're talking about, um, uh, cultivation of an ontological cultivation and an ethical cultivation. The, this, these are some of the dichotomies that this line points at. Um, like river sand, the obstacles of our misdeeds will be eradicated. We repent for those misdeeds of previous eras all the way to this present life. Those previous eras are the billions of years of us in existence in our, in our migrating um, self from body form to body form to body form. And each of those bodily forms, we have enacted misdeeds in all of those eras all the way to this present life. So we're not just thinking about what I did yesterday or last year or when I was five. We're thinking about there are things that I am unaware of that I did a billion years ago. And for that too, I'm repenting. So that we in a sense, we're habituating ourselves to not literally thinking about millions of years ago, what might I have done? What we're actually doing is we're thinking about the ways in which we act that may go unnoticed by us, even within this lifetime, eons ago could be a month ago in conceptual and mental space. These things could be very distant from us. And so we want to also take, we're, this, is, this is allowing our consciousness to understand that there are misdeeds that we that we may um, enact that are have gone unnoticed by us. We have been fooled by the various shapes of fire, wind, earth, and water. This is to say, the 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 phases. This is using. Um, this is not the Chinese five phases. This is a. a clearly a Buddhist borrowing of those phases from the, the um, Indian version. Um, the, these, are the, these are the elements that are referred to in the Yin Fu Jing and the Qing Jing Jing that create the phenomenal world that is ultimately illusory. So this is saying we have suffered from the illusions of the phenomenal um, um, constructs. These are not ultimate. By our attachment to the sensual smells, tastes, forms, and sounds, we have broken the law. We have 
not only witnessed the permutations of uh, the phenomenal, but we have become attached to it. This is the, this is the distinction. We believe it. Um, and the only way to change that belief system is for direct perception of um, ultimate reality in its non-dual nature. That is the nature of the perfect mind, so to speak. And the repentance is all about this. So we're still, we're looking at the dual cultivation of Xing and Ming encrypted in this text. Desire, angry, anger, jealousy, evil speech and lies, killing, stealing licentiousness now by the way when you look at that and you're um, and you've taken precepts you realize that this is an enumeration of the antithesis of our precepts unrestrained indulgence in pleasures disobeying parents disgracing masters and teachers etc and not believing that misdeeds and virtuous actions bear their fruit ultimately the ignorance or the willful ignorance of the karmic cycle and co that cosmological reality will ultimately cause us to, that will undermine our efforts as cultivators. You can't be a cultivator and not believe that there is a cause and effect reality in the cosmos. Because if you don't believe in the cause and effect reality of the cosmos, then you've actually, um, it's, you've thrown a wrench in the works of the entire Taoist system because it relies on this reality. Um, willfully denying reason and disregarding our own conscience. We have, our conscience is a watcher. When we, when we take precepts, what we do is we essentially create a schism in our consciousness, which is the thing that desires to do something and the other part of us that make, makes it not do that. We are then vying with ourselves in some sense and we're establishing the two selves. One that is the, um, um, initially at least, artificially um, watching over the other aspects of ourself. And this part of ourself, ourselves can develop over time and grow this conscious into a very formidable um, consequential aspect of our um, consciousness, which will then ultimately spontaneously derive right action. That's the whole point of the precept. Um, we have been tossed about in some sorrow, suffering torments without end. Each cause, each decision made in a moment of weakness has been a delusional barricade to knowing our inner nature. So when we talk about whether it's nadan, whatever it is, uh, in Taoist cultivation techniques, those that are ontological in nature, we are talking about knowing our inner nature. And here, this is the tie-in that samsara and the suffering of torments, each of these are caused by a decision that was made in a moment of weakness. So our ways of being create these karmic realities, and each of those is a delusional barricade to knowing our inner nature. So in this way, the convectional interdependent reality of inner nature and ethics is made plain. We see here that knowing inner nature without knowing ethics, without being generous, is not really possible. We can't be cruel and enlightened simultaneously. We can't be selfish and enlightened simultaneously. We can't be self-interested and enlightened simultaneously. Um, we have failed to recognize the illusions of the six senses and have wallowed in the river of desires. Don't worry, Sam, I'm watching the clock. Now, since we have obtained a human body and inherited the true religion, we should be glad of this once in a thousand lifetime chance to integrate ourselves by examining our mind. Now, this is a line which preempts where I wanted to go next in the Beidou Jing, which we don't have to do because I'll just talk about it here. Um, the human body is an important, remember we just talked about the six realms, the celestial spirit, human, the animal, hungry, ghost, hell. These six realms can be either cognitive conditional realms wherein we in, inhabit certain mentalities or they can be cosmological realms 
within the cycle of samsaric rebirth. You now you can take it either way that you want. That's a larger discussion. Um, but for this, this context here, what we're looking at here is the precious nature of being born into a human body. Because in the human body, we also have the human mind. And the human mind, according to both the Taoist and Buddhist traditions, is the only mind that has enough of that below it and that above it, which is to say it has the potential for celestial mind, but is also tortured by the mundane. It's because we have this possibility of vacillation that we can actually learn the lessons that are required for um, true understanding of our innate nature. So we should be glad of this once in a thousand lifetime chance to integrate ourselves by examining our mind, to become whole through examining the mind. And so in order to examine the mind, the human mind, which is part of the inborn quality within the human realm, we first have to obtain a human body. So in order to be in the disposition of examining the human mind, we have to be in the human body. The human body is the product of transmigration. Transmigration is the product of ethics and karma. So in order to examine the mind, we have to have a human body. In order to have a human body, we have to earn that body. Not only that, but as in the Beidou Jing in, in the following text, that human body can also be born into realms that are incompatible with cultivation. You could be born into a war zone. You could be born into abject poverty. You could be born into extraordinary violence and, uh, and any other number of sufferings, all of which can make it, can impede our ability to, in the Taoist context, to come into contact with the Tao, either in scriptural or teacher form. Um, and so we see that the entire trajectory of cultivation is rooted in, if we follow, if we follow this, um, what's enumerated here, our ability to examine the mind, to be born into a human body, is all contingent on our behaviors, our ethics, our ability to care for those people around us. Our full benevolent engagement of society at large. So when we look around and we see the war, the struggle, the rampant disease, it's no reason to give up hope. It's reason to actually dig in deeper. That our cultivation should be not to polarize ourselves within these political um, dichotomies, but rather to integrate ourselves directly with the people around us in meaningful, benevolent ways. I'm not talking politically here. I'm referring literally to the scriptures as they state, uh, as are stated here. Um, this is our path, that even in light of a war and struggle, uh, we, have to, we have to circumvent our initial and expected um, reactions to that, which are self-defensive, self-interested um, ways of being. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of the value of generosity and, and, and um, um, peace. I think that brings us to the time limit. I do want to allow for the Q&A, which will probably or help organize this a little better um, per your particular needs. Um, so I will turn it over to Sam to produce those questions or Rosie, whoever's doing it. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, yeah, so if anybody has questions or comments even uh, that they want to drop in the chat box, um, I think most people probably have experience using Zoom, but if you don't, the chat box is at the bottom of your screen, most likely.
It was that bad, huh? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, what uh, I think we have the late, you know, I've asked a question, we showed a little bit relaxed. Maybe like uh, someone, oh, they have a question. Maybe just answer that later. I can have someone come to talk. Maybe answer that question. Could you say that again, Shenyun? Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, for me, I just, uh, okay, I, I told you first, maybe my English is, you know, I try to salute it, try to do my best. Uh, really, I like your speak, uh, what you talk and speak is very, very cool. Um, you know, we um, we always talk about the Taoism, you talk about the Taoism, the West and the East, a little bit different. Um, but I want to the common is, you know, it's not just like a East and the West different, also in China it's different. So we have to think about the, uh, you know, for my idea is the Taoism, you know, in China during the, they have a cultural re revolution, everybody know that. So there is a totally like a broken lot, a lot of culture. Uh, so after, it's just like a few priests, but after, uh, you know, the China, the gate, we call the gate open, or all, all, everything's open. Um, the open, as the, you know, it's a lot of Taoism, they know really, they don't know why that, and also they don't have an idea why they want to be a priest, why they go to the temple. You know, a lot of the priests that went to the temple because the family have a problem, they go to the temple, oh, I'm just all to my family, go to the temple. Uh, some people say, okay, maybe the temple will have food and easy for living, they go to the temple. So as the, the, the problem in China also, if you travel a lot of different temple, everything a little bit different. You know, either the people, the thought, idea, everything is different. So now as most the scholar, either in China or the scholar, most people who research, everything just on the book. You know, we, we don't have an idea, we, we have to use a book. You know, just a book, say like you reading the Zao Wan Ke, talking about the, the uh, like 12 wish, so something like that. So we all use the wish. But in China, uh, I want to talk in China, either the Taoism, you know, a lot of people, um, we have a Taoist school. You know, most of the professor, the teacher are from the university. But if they, the you know, that's the problem is the teacher, the professor, they don't know about the Taoism, that all, everything is, from the book, you know, but we believe religion first, we have to use our heart, or, or, you know, use our heart. So we try, we have to research what kind of religion. Now, um, and the religion, how to say, if you use English, what do I say? So uh, we have to uh, really trust what do we believe. But if you go to the school, they just, oh, this is Taoist, this is, that's Catholic. You know, it's like it's an old door talking about Taoism and the priest talking about Taoism is that different. It's in China have the, the problem uh, for me is, you know, it's a lot of people, if you're talking about Taoism, oh, Taoism, okay, either the priest, the Taoism, like that, 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 that. They don't really research and really, not really like say, think about who I am, when I'm be a priest, what I'm doing, doing. It's the every way you say, but of course, in a way, uh, I want to talk about the politics, you talk about politics. In China, uh, it's a whatever ancient time, they never, the, uh, all the religion, they never, they can difficult to order the politics, they always waste the politics, you know, not like waste, you know, they cannot care about the politics. This is in China have this problem. So uh, you don't know, okay. So it's everything we call that like a politics right. And we, I want to say it's like a school, you know, no, it's a, all the school is the same. You know, everything half the politics is right. You know, everywhere is the same. You know. As in China also, uh, you know, and we support the Ming Dynasty, all the different dynasty, and uh, if the government think, okay, this is some paragraph right, I think it's right, it's the Taoism. Uh, like uh, uh, if everybody are uh, reading the Huangdi Neijing, Everybody know the Huangdi Neijing. And for the real Huangdi Neijing, they have some like, you know, in you know, the government, some part, they just cut it. They don't believe it, they just cut it. Uh, tradition, they have like, like Huangdi Neijing and uh, have a lot of book, just to say government, they want to say, okay, we have to go this way. That all the professor, I know say poet, professor, a uh, lot of priests, a lot of people, they just follow the government's idea, how to explain the Taoism book or the, the philosophy, the idea, they always have this problem. So, 
I saw one 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 to the one to two say. Um, uh, also, you talk about the respect. Uh, you know, uh, I want to say the respect is is the not all the world have a problem. All the world have a problem. Um, uh, what do you say? Uh, it's the respect. First, we uh, talk about the idea. No, it's also about the politics. The big environment have the problem. You know, all we live in the world that we suppose fighting for idea. You know, all but no, we can't fight for our idea. So most of the time, you are talking with people. Okay, I don't like you. Uh, I don't like your idea. I don't like you. I don't like you. I don't like your idea. It's the good country we have to the bad and the good have to live together. The all good idea and the bad idea have to together. What's the good idea? We have to like, okay, he's have that idea. That guy have this idea. The two idea, then we can think about this the idea how to benefit for our human, for the world. We know just like this, then we know just like, okay, you know, it's the bigger problem is to separate. Yeah, and so, um, this is the idea you have to do together, uh, not like a together, like finger out, we call the Tai Chi. Everybody, the bad guy and the good guy, everybody, uh, either good idea, bad idea, everything together, we always have an inspiration. What kind of good idea, then you make a good idea, hold, hope, uh, uh, the, the world or hope, uh, the human, hope the country. But no, we don't have that. This is because uh, we say we know when to say the government bad. Because of course, human also fish, you know, human also fish. The government, they have the problem. The government. No, oh, okay, sorry. Thank you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanna we have a few questions in the in the chat. Um, so I want to get to those. I appreciate your uh, opinions here. And we're and also know that you're gonna get to it in your talk. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> no, not my talk. <laughs> so uh, let's make sure we get a few things. Oh, okay. um, and uh, um, Josh may have already read them, but I want to say it out loud just for the purposes of recording so people can go back and understand it. Um, Mary wrote, uh, she was just wondering about the ways in which the scripture talks about the epidemics being a response to the wrongs of society. So that sort of friar and brimstone uh, that you meant referenced from the text. So if in the West, uh, what type of understanding can be a part of certain religions, but can be kind of taboo in politics, uh, like to make those conclusions. So if that's part of a monastic or Taoist teaching, how do certain societies, like in China, understand this? Uh, is that taboo to say that the pandemic is a result of, you know, X, Y, or Z, or just wondering how that info looks uh, historically or contextually? Well, that, that's it. That's a great question, and I and I think that this is where we to to give a secular um, spin to a religious concept is always a little tricky, you know. Um, and uh, also, to speak in secular contexts through the religious perspective is also tricky, um, but. It, it can be done. And I think that the way in which, um, so for instance, by the way, when uh, Xuanyun knows this, Lindsay knows this, I'm sure many people here know this. When you go to a temple in China, there is um, generally speaking, uh, some surface somewhere with thousands of free copies of the Ganying Pian. Um, and the Ganying Pian is not necessarily um, a, a text, this is called the, um, the treatise on retribution and response. Um, it's a book about karma and human activities and how one should be. It's a moral, it's a moral tale um, that's given out free at temples for secular people to pick up and read. Um, and I think that uh, this is interesting in that there has to be a translated intermediary, I don't mean translated in English, I mean translated from the religious to the secular, there has to be some middle ground for these two domains to be able to communicate. Um, we don't want to speak about religions um, merely in the materialistic terms of secular secularism and vice versa. And so we need this middle ground. In, in Taoism, we have this middle ground text. Um, 
And by the way, I think it's still available for nearly free on Amazon um, um, through the Purple Cloud Press. The great people, Johan and the, and the rest, um, have this available. It's a great text to read and understand some of the the moral mechanisms within Taoism, um, and it's and it's generally intended for the secular um, uh, um, reader. Um, but uh, we don't run around in Taoism, by the way, saying you had this coming. This is what you get. Now you're all sick. You know what I mean? We don't you don't see that happening. Um, it's it's more of a uh, here is the um, here's the antidote. Be kind and generous. Give it a shot. You know, um, it's it's not a, a moralistic. Um, uh, you don't receive moralistic beatings in general from the Taoist community. Awesome. Um, I'll just kind of go in, in order here with some of these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosie's asking, what compelled you, Josh, uh, to be a Taoist priest? And could you say a little bit more about your personal trajectory following this path? Oh, that's, that's sort of biographical. Um, is that what you want? Uh, I, I would, I'll let her chime in. All right. Um, All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I uh, was a Chinese studies, Taoist studies major, it was specifically Taoism in the 90s. And uh, I was raised and um, not by my parents, I mean academically um, on uh, Nathan Sivan and A.C. Graham and a steady diet of Joseph Needham and the like. Um, that stuff is not what I'm talking about today. Um, that stuff was informative and all of that. And uh, but I, the problem with studying in the '90s um, in America was that I was studying Taoism as if it was uh, in a crypt or something like that, like it was a corpse, and I felt that that wasn't getting me anywhere and it was hap and it was creating actually um problematic um opinions um especially since at the time this is before livia and lewis and all the rest of them really started to do what they do and all of the great um, Taoist scholars that we enjoy today that they that was a much more academic um, domain then and so you really didn't get a feel for what Taoism is. You got a feel for like certain philological issues in a text or something like that. It wasn't um, very, um, the only one I can think of or the only ones I can think of were Michael Sasso and um, Rick, I, I mean, um, Christopher Shipper. Those, those two embodied and exemplified a new era um, or a burgeoning era of Taoist studies, which is to say the Taoist priest or the scholar practitioner. Um, and so from the 90s on, it was more or less the, the typical problematic journey of trying to find Taoists in America um, in any of the domains that Taoists in America exist, ranging from the martial arts world to the, um, oh, I don't know, the, the new age. I, I'm not really sure, but you, you, you can imagine it's a strange journey. I'm sure all of us have actually um, tripped along that path as well. Um, all along, I went to college in China as well. There I had some good direct experiences, although it was the 90s. Some of the temples I visited were still literally in ruins from the Cultural Revolution, tiles all over the place, bricks smashed, that type of scenario. So it was an interesting picture, but I did also get to go to actual ritual and actual um, um, meet actual practitioners in the new in the in the in a, at that time a lot of the reconstructed um by virtue of the chinese taoist association um temples um and so then it's just been a journey of of meeting people and cultivating taoist friendships this is an embodiment of that um xuan yun and Lindsay and, and ming dao um we 
meet each other along the way. We, we, we study together. We learn from each other. Um, it's funny, the first, uh, Xuan Yun would definitely not remember this, but uh, Xuan Yun embodied some, the first moment I met Xuan Yun was, I don't know what it was, 20, whenever the, the, the Boston Dallas conference was, I was wandering around by BU lost. I had no idea where this conference was. And I saw this young Taoist priest tying his sock. And I went and sat next to him and I said, where is this thing? And he said, he got up and he said, follow me. But it was like this very taken care of feeling that I had as Xuan Yun literally led me by the hand into this conference. And I thought, all right, I feel safe now that I found this guy. And that's generally a depiction of this Taoist framework as it is. You, you meet, literally meet people on the street and we take each other by the hand into our various places um, safely and in a heartfelt way. Yeah, thank you for uh, describing that. Really appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I see there's thumbs up from Rosie as well. So uh, our next question in the chat here uh, is from Tatiana asking, as a beginner in Taoism, what practices and readings do you recommend? I know you already touched on one, but um, if there's anything else you want to elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are lots of great books out there in terms of reading. Um, it depends on what you want to read. If you if you want direct access to scripture, what I just read today is Our Part in Clouds translations. Um, if you want historical context along with scripture and in a really beautiful academic clarity, there's Lewis Komiafi's books. And uh, there's just so much to say about this. Where should someone turn? But if you're looking for Taoist community instead of study materials, um, that is a little harder. I don't really, um, other than the people here, Lindsay teaches, I teach, Shrenyan teaches. Um, so uh, there are many other great teachers around and each of those um, institutions and teachers has their own particular focus and flavor. And that's something that one really has to discern on their own. But what I will say to you is this, there's a lot. I used to tell people there's almost nothing, but now I can I can truly say there's a lot out there and a lot of it is really good. Um, my email is joshpainter at gmail.com. If anyone wants a list of resources, you can um, uh, you can directly approach me to find those things. Thank you. Uh, the next question from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, maybe Sinetica. Uh, the Dharma is in my idea, something fixed. Uh, am I correct in thinking that it's like a column for our existence? And perhaps. Um... So we have terms in Taoism that are there. They persist actually in, in many intellectual forms in Chinese um, intellectual history. But the one that comes to mind in terms of this is Li, which uh, I'll put it in the chat. It means like the, um, uh, one sec. That character is like the inner nature of something. It's the grain within wood or the grain within jade or literally the grain within a person, the innate qualities that exist within any framework that are its ultimate nature or grain, that are, be, that are beneath and below all of the superimpositions of things like culture, language, um, and preference. Uh, and so uh, though we're, don't, we're, we're not, um, uh, I'm not talking specifically about Dharma here, we can talk here about um, the notion that there, there do exist um, aspects in our understanding of the mechanisms of the cosmos and of our consciousness that are fixed, non-deviating um, uh, infrastructures that, um, that we aspire to um, conjoin with. In some cases, that's called the Tao. In other cases, that's called Li. And it depends on the text you're looking at. And the, particularly, 
in the era that the text arises that you're looking at as well. Awesome. So the next question we have is uh, a question this uh, Pavel uh, received recently. And he's asking, should we engage in discussions with the go with the flow people? Uh, which <laughs> you, you may have a picture of who, who that might be, the go with the flow people. And if so, what would be the right way within the tradition to do that? Keeping in mind, not only the need for truth to be heard, but also the benefit uh, of those who are asking. Yeah, we have a specific we have a specific term for this. It's used in both Taoism and Buddhism. It's called skillful means, which is that we approach the student in ways that are consistent with their current understanding. We don't shovel things into students. We don't force students into ways of of hearing. They will hear the way they hear. That the way they hear can change over time, and it changes over time as they're introduced skillfully two concepts at the right time in the right way. And so we never force feed a teaching. That's actually grotesque. And so um, we simply provide the teachings to the listener as the listener is capable of hearing them. And we don't judge them and we don't belabor their so-called ignorance or whatever like that. We just don't do that. Awesome. So the next one, uh, James is asking if you could unpack a little bit what you mean by religious and secular, uh, probably in reference to the first question. Uh, it would be very easy to see uh, an artificial dichotomy here, which I'm sure you don't intend. Those are his words. So the religious and the secular, what I mean by that specifically, is what's meant in the tradition by the um, the the uh, the precept receiving lineage holder and the otherwise intellectually and even spiritually interested um, observer. Um, so we we go through a process religiously called Gui and any other number of things showed yet, whatever, there's a few different terms for it, where we re we, we take on the the responsibility of of certain behavioral um, qualities. And it's that that I'm talking about as religious. It's I'm talking specifically about the community. Um, I'm not talking about a distinction within a text, whether it can be subject to a religious or a secular hermeneutic. What I'm talking about is the community of people itself. Sure, that's very clear. Um, Rich is asking uh, if you're, t um, let me see how to phrase this. Uh, a term comes to mind with your teaching, uh, compassionate merit meritocracy. And he's yeah. asking that so we call, mm, Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Is it smooth? I glitched for a second. Okay. Um, so this um, compassionate meritocracy, that's a, I like that phrase. Um, in the, in, and I have to say that uh, that is kind of what we, we actually have a, there's a, at the end of the, the scriptures, of our recitation of the scriptures, we understand that through the voicing of the scriptures we have made available for the people who are listening a certain type of um giving and that giving comes with it this sort of merit it's a it's a it's a meritous deed and so that develops what we call going to like a uh, what do we call it um oh, one of one of my parting clouds people could help me um dedication of merit. So at the end of our scriptures, we dedicate the merit that's gained from these practices. And so we should be in a constant state of the dedication of merit. Why do we do that? It is this meritocracy in the sense that when we proceed through our, our existence, maintaining our precepts, whether those be religiously defined or just ethically defined, 
which could be sort of like autonomous, um, we we develop and um, uh, start to accumulate um, what we call merit, which is essentially like a spiritual currency in a sense. We don't keep that merit because keeping that merit then is it gives rise to a type of arrogance or self-assuredness that is consistent with self-centeredness. So at the end of all of our scriptural recitations, we dedicate that merit, but we don't want to keep that. We want that to be available to all sentient beings who don't have that because they haven't, for instance, been able to develop it in the current conditions within which they exist. So any meritocracy that we develop or any um, merit that we develop, any merit you know, um, that's accumulated, we specifically and intellectually get rid of it as a donation as well. Because just like money, we don't hoard. And so even in our karmic um, um, aspirations for, for better things to come, we don't think in terms of, I just gave that homeless person money. This is going to be great. I'll probably win the lottery today. That's a self-centered giving. It's not an actual giving because the giving was actually done for ourselves in that sense. So we want to, we need to undermine that type of mentality that can arise through the following precepts, et cetera. I love that. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Jonathan, who is interested in the daily performance, uh, in quotes, of these scriptures as ritual and prayer. Would it be mm -hmm. correct to say that they are a distinct form of, it says mediation, but perhaps he means meditation, particularly with spirits and deities? If you could reflect further on some aspect of this, it'd be greatly appreciated. I, I think he does mean mediation, right, no, Jonathan? I, I thumbs up. Again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's a, It's great. Uh, and it, 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 I think either one of them could fit. Um, but uh, uh, hi, Jonathan, by the way, it's been a long time. Um, the, uh, the performance of scripture, ritual and prayer um, is specifically uh, and obviously a form of communication with the celestial. Now, um, this can be understood in different ways, um, and I'm resistant to um, exposing these, these interpretations, but one, one thing that we, we keep in mind with our various practices is that they are multivalent um, in an interesting way, or multidimensional even in that sense. When we pray to deities, we can view them as external or we can view them as internal. And this is, this is something, the issue of an internal deity, and I'm not talking about the Shang, in case anyone is aware of this, I'm not talking about the Shang, Shang Qing internal deities. That's not what I mean. Um, I'm talking about the view that the deity is quality and that that quality is an inherent aspect of our consciousness. And it is to that thing that we are communicating so that the 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 um, performance of ritual is actually um, an ingraining of ourself with the highest aspiration of ourself, um, and so that the Li, that character that I put in the chat of the of what we perceive as the deity's inner nature and our inner nature become enmeshed in some some sense, um, and so the deity can be both outer and inner is what I'm trying to say, and it can also be secret. And that part we can't talk about. Then okay, great. I think if no one else has any questions, I'm going to ask one. Um, you mentioned in your talk almost like a dichotomy in these two views of Taoism, right? Um, of the Taoist who's kind of like a hermit in a cave and the Taoist that's in society. And I just wanted to know your perspective on, you know, how that, how they fit together. Um, you know, these sort yeah. of extended retreat uh, versus living in society daily. Sure. And, and it's really important that we understand that that dichotomy is not just spatial and um, um, defined in terms of geography and sequestering. 
that dichotomy could actually exist in the in our mentality itself as in retreat and engagement um and so like i was saying we in from the the earliest now this could get this is a deep topic and it it it, we could talk about this for the next four hours, um, and we, but we can't, so I have to sort of gloss this. Um, there is a attention, though it's not a um, uh, it's 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 not a problematic tension. It's a it's a, a philosophical. T uh, it's a it's an, uh, a conceptual tension, I should say, um, which is in the good way. Um, the uh the um there's a persistent dichotomy in Taoist practice theory etc that exists between this notion of the void and the thing or form and emptiness it's in the first chapter of the Tao Te Ching it's it exists in all of those other text bodies that um we see that we might call the 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 prototypical Taoist text, the primordial Taoist text, Guanzhou and the and the Neye within, and all of that stuff, the dichotomy takes on more nuanced terminologies as we move through the Taoist tradition. It all, it even takes on geographical connotations like northern versus southern school, things like this, um, Xing and Ming, and these varieties of things, ethical versus uh, uh, ontological, and so. When we think about retreat, that actually is part of the framework of the of Xing, our inner nature. And when we think about the world and our engagement with it, that would be Ming, our sort of life destiny in this framework of our existence as derived by our karmic causes and their effects. And so we, we do cultivate in both of these spheres. And this notion of periodic retreat and periodic engagement is actually how we fully cultivate. This becomes clear, I think, most profoundly in the Longmen tradition, is we vacillate historically between these two places, gaining prominence over the other in various places historically in both Taoist text and tradition. But I think, in a sense, Longmen is in some way the culmination or the Mm, the harmonizing or solution to this um, potentially problematic dichotomy. Um, and it's in the writings of Kunyang and Liu Yiming, particularly in the Qing dynasty, by the way, that this is heavily resolved. Um, and so uh, this is, this is um, that issue that retreat and engagement are both necessary for the fully reverted elixir, so to speak. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. Um, that's the, I believe, unless I missed anything, uh, that is the questions we have for today. And that brings us just about the time. Uh, so. Thank you for being here, Josh. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone in the audience as well, asking their questions and engaging. Uh, and we'll be back at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 if you're on the West Coast like myself. Uh, Deng Mingdao will be speaking then. And so I hope to see everyone else again uh, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. See you soon. Thank you, Shuanyin. Okay, bye.